Israel's ruling coalition has collapsed. Jerusalem al Quds is not safe. International recognition of Palestine has gained momentum, France being the latest in a non-binding vote. The peace process shelved, at least for now. U.S. relations strained and an economy that's struggling. What else can go wrong for Bibi Netanyahu and Israel? Stay tuned for another edition of the debate. Our guests for this edition of the debate are musician and author Gilad Atzman, who joins us from London, and historian, author, and journalist Jeffrey Alderman, who also joins us from London. Gentlemen, welcome. Uh, Jeffrey Alderman, let me start with you. Netanyahu's team, minus two, two centrist ministers, including Zippy Livni, who were eliminated, a coalition that is said to be so tattered early elections, obviously to have been called now in March, this only after almost two years in power. Netanyahu calls it coalition politics. What do you call it? Well, I think, you know, Israeli governments historically have been very short-lived. And I'm actually pleasantly surprised that this coalition, which is a coalition of extremes of one to the other, has lasted as long as it has. I think, uh, personally, I think that Netanyahu has engineered this crisis in order to call elections, in order to... Uh, to uh, realign the politics of the Knesset in, in Jerusalem, Israel's capital, so that he can uh, put together a more amenable cabinet. What was the le adjective you used there for, your, for the cabinet there? I didn't get it. Jeffrey Alderman. Uh, uh, what, what, I mean, what I meant to say was that <clears throat> Netanyahu has engineered this so-called crisis in order to call elections with the hope that as a result of the Knesset elections he will be able to put together a coalition all Israeli governments are coalitions but his hope I think is to put together a coalition which he finds personally more amenable because clearly the present coalition which has now collapsed he found extremely difficult to deal with Gilad Asman, what do you think? Engineering a crisis in order to, uh, in hopes, I should say, just like our guest there said, to get a coalition that would listen to him. I'm in a total um, agreement. I think that it uh, was an uh, engineered crisis, and I think that uh, Netanyahu proved once again uh, that he is uh, slightly more uh, sophisticated than his uh, partners. I would like to uh, delve into the background that led uh, to this crisis. Israel performed <laughs> uniquely bad in the last uh, military uh, escalation. It has been defeated in Gaza. There, were a lot, there was a lot of criticism uh, in Israel in the way in which uh, Netanyahu handled the crisis, <clears throat> a lot of criticism uh, from, the, from, from the right, from uh, the Israeli national parties, uh, even in Netanyahu's own, own party. And what Netanyahu did in this crisis, he used this conflict on the national bill, uh, the conflict with uh, uh, Livni and uh, Tipi Livni uh, and, uh, and Lapid in order to reinstate his position as a valid national voice. Netanyahu understands, and is right, that uh, Israeli politics and Israeli population is shifting to the right. It becomes more and more nationalist, patriotic, and Jewish. There is a serious call, political call, that is, uh, that is backed by the vast majority of the, of the people in Israel, that Israel becomes the Jewish state rather than a Jewish democracy, which is a peculiar concept anyway. Netanyahu is riding these events, and he used ne Livni and, uh, and uh, Lapid in order it reinstating his position as a right-wing leader. Very uh, clever. Uh, wow, uh, and I'm thinking it's, uh, it's the opposite. Maybe I'm, not, maybe I'm missing something here. Uh, I'm not too sure I follow the fact that uh, you have uh, this cabinet and his team that have been uh, not in power for, well, in power for almost two years, and you have a series of challenges, well, to use Netanyahu's uh, uh, statements here, uh, security, economic, and regional, in which he said there is a need for a large and experienced ruling party. 
Well, what difference is that going to make? The larger party, and of course, to bring more experience to the ruling party. I mean, I thought Livni, let's uh, use the, her as an example, had had experience. So, what am I here? The fact that this larger party is going to make a dif difference, Jeffrey Alderman. Uh, we, we, we must remember that over the past few months, uh, both the ministers who, who have now departed from the government, uh, Netanyahu's government, have engaged in a public slanging match against Netanyahu. And uh, Netanyahu cannot, could not control these two ministers, and th therefore he fired them, and he hopes that as a result of Knesset elections, he will be able to put together a coalition which is, uh, uh, w w which is more under his control, w w w w uh, over which he can exert much greater discipline. Uh, I agree with my colleague. I Israel is becoming more Jewish. This is partly demographic. Uh, and, and it is likely, well, one always hesitates to prophesy in Israeli politics, but it is likely that a more nationalistic government will emerge from the Knesset elections next March. Okay, let's talk a little bit I more. I would like to add... Go ahead, go ahead, Gilad Sassman. Can, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah I, I, it is more than likely uh, that we will see again uh, the religious uh, parties uh, being involved, the religious and orthodox parties being involved in Israeli politics. As we know, this was largely a secular, a secular uh, uh, government in Israeli terms, although kind of Israel, Betenu, Bennett, they are uh, um, religious Jews. We will see more Orthodox, more rabbis involved in Israel decisions, in Israeli political decisions. We will have to get the approval of a rabbi whether uh, to drive buses or not driving buses or whether to attack uh, uh, Lebanon, Syria or Palestine. And this is something that we have to accept. Israel defines itself now as the Jewish national state. And it's only natural that the rabbis would decide what this country is doing. And uh, this is obviously reflecting very badly uh, on, uh, on Jews, on Judaism. And it is a very complicated uh, topic. Well, wait a minute here now. Uh, I mean, let's look at the report card, though, Jeffrey Alderman. I don't quite understand. I mean, our guest, our Gilad Asman, talked about the Gaza war. I don't know if you agree or not. By many accounts, that has been a failure. Yes, nationalism for people in Israel, okay, that's good for them. But on the international uh, 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 scene here, Israel has failed. The are, are we looking at more settlements then to be announced and to be built? Are we looking at more wars? Our guest alluded there. Uh, is that what's going to happen? I mean, uh, many are saying that another win... Uh, based on this quote I'm reading for Israeli right, will leave little hope for Middle East peace talks. Let's not forget that. After the last round of negotiations collapsed, and of course uh, we're looking at more violence in Jerusalem, al Quds, and the occupied West Bank, which many say is now experiencing a third intifada. So is that what we're looking at in a more severe form? Uh, I, I, I think that, that uh, we're looking at a government which looks more kindly upon Jewish settlements in Judea and Samaria. Uh, and uh, don't forget the uh, recent American uh, midterm congressional elections have resulted in the Republicans uh, uh, being in control of both houses of the American legislature. This is very good from Netanyahu's point of view. So what does it matter? If, if a minority of MPs at, uh, in, the, in the British Parliament at Westminster voted to recognise a Palestinian state alongside, let me repeat, alongside the Israeli state, what does that matter? Netanyahu has a Congress which is more amenable to his point of view. Uh, and uh, Mr Atzmon is absolutely right. I think it more likely than not that we will see the uh, religious parties in Israel uh, re-entering the government and they, they have a particular agenda. It's, incidentally, that agenda is not necessarily uh, focused primarily on uh, Jewish communities in Judea and Samaria, but there are other issues uh, over which the religious uh, parties in Israel would like a greater say. 
Well, Gil, Esmond, I'm still stuck on the fact that what's going to happen uh, come uh, March, what is the 17th, when these uh, uh, elections are to take place. I mean, uh, do you think, I mean, Israel has to, and Netanyahu has to consider the international community here, don't they? I mean, okay, uh, uh, one, ex one example being the uh, recognition that, of Palestine, uh, I, even though it's non-binding by many countries at this point. I think that Israel is not concerned uh, with uh, Israeli politicians are not very concerned with international politics. And the reason is very simple. Um, um, American politics is still dominated largely by APAC, by the Jewish lobby, by a few Jewish lobbies, uh, by J Street and so on. Nahum, um, Nahum, Nahum. British politics. Br Br British politics is dominated by the CFI, conservative friends of Israel, and uh, if Miliband would take over, which it doesn't stand a chance, it will be LFI. In France, it is the CRIF, and as uh, Mr. Elderman mentioned, the fact, the fact that, that uh, the, the parliament, few parliaments in Europe voted for Palestinian, uh, Palestinian state only, only assured the existence of the Jewish state on Palestinian land. So we have to understand it. I think that the issues here are actually deeper and more interesting. And if you, if you don't mind, I will just elaborate it in a second. Israel has an history of shunning its, pol its politicians, its prime ministers, its chief of staffs at the time of a conflict. It happened to Golda Meir, it happened to her chief of staff, Dado El Azar. It happened to Peretz, who was the um, defense minister uh, in 2006 uh, and is the chief of staff, Dan Chalutz. And it happens now to Netanyahu. Netanyahu didn't survive. Netanyahu government didn't survive the last war in Gaza. Israelis drop bombs on Palestinians. They ethnic, they, they cleanse qu quarter of the population of Gaza. And at the end of the day, it is the Israeli government that is falling apart. Now, you have to remember, the escalation in Gaza was there to split the Palestinian, the Palestinian people and their uh, unity government. Six months ago, seven months ago, Israel was devastated by the, by, the unif, by the unity government between the Hamas and the PA. Interestingly enough, after six months of clashes, of a horrible war in Gaza, Third Intifada in the making, it is actually the Israeli government that is falling. It is the Israeli unity that is falling apart. This is very interesting, and this is indication on the future. Which you can find on gilat.co.uk. Uh, we appreciate that. And actually, that's a very good picture I see of Netanyahu that you posted on your website. Palestinians have managed to topple another Israeli team there. Uh, and that was the last paragraph, I believe, that you had on that. Very clever and interesting that that has indeed occurred to Israel. Thank you for that. Let's take a quick time out right now to listen to some of the viewer comments, and we'll come back to the debate. There. Jeffrey Alderman, I need to get your reaction to this uh, Zippy Livni. I don't know what you think of her. However, she has said new elections are to replace extremist, provocative, paranoid uh, team, the justice minister accusing Netanyahu of inciting sectors in Israel against each other. Does she have points there, especially inciting sectors against each other? I, I wouldn't go so far as to say there's been inciting of sectors. Look, Israel is an extremely complex society. Uh, and this complexity this uh, pluralization uh, uh, is reflected in the Knesset. I Israel has the, the most perfect form of proportional representation of any parliament anywhere in the world. That's actually invented by a, a, a 19th century uh, British political analyst called Thomas Hare, but that's a historical footnote. That, uh, and, and as a result of proportional representation in the Knesset, it's possible for extremely small parties to gain representation and then to use it as a lever to their ends. Uh, I would be the last person to defend Israeli democracy as a perfect democracy. Uh, but I do think that the system of proportional representation uh, uh, and the fact that Israelis 
cannot vote okay. as we can in Britain for a local constituency MP makes it an extremely complex model to Very put well. together. Sorry to, sorry to cut you off. A last question, uh, Gilad Atman, in 30 seconds. Paris has come out and said there will be no peace or security with Netanyahu. Do you agree? Um, I think that uh, this is the, the, the case. Uh, the, I must once again mention that the word peace as harmony and reconciliation doesn't even exist in Hebrew. The word shalom doesn't mean peace. It only means security for the Jews. The Israelis are not interested in peace. They are not looking for peace. They look to, they try to, uh, to rebuild a ghetto and the fact that they surrounded themselves with all those walls makes it very clear that the Zionist project has failed and it's a total disaster and I'm uh, very sad for them and I'm very worried about peace for the, for the next gen for future generations. I think Israel is a very big threat to world peace. We're going to have to end it there. Thank you. Musician and author Gilad Atzman there from London. And also from London, historian, author, and journalist Jeffrey Alderman spoke to us. Thank you for tuning in to another edition of The Debate. From Mikhail Vitavi and the entire team in the capital, Tehran, it's goodbye. <laughs>